A few weeks ago, I was here at the church when I realized that I hadn't eaten all day. I still had things to do. There was only about an hour before we had an evening meeting, so I didn't really have time to run home and make food. So, as any uh, good collegiate age person who grew up without a Chipotle would do, I ran to Chipotle. Uh, and if you've, if you've been there recently, if you've gotten your order to go, it comes in a paper bag. And those paper bags have a variety of stories on them. Each bag is different every time you go, and they are usually fun, lighthearted, whimsical, short stories. The story on this particular bag was not what I expected. It was written by a 17-year-old named Fue, an essay contest winner. It is titled, Two Minutes About Sardines. A helicopter overhead. A truck engine roars past soldiers in dirty green uniforms surrounded by a cloud of warm brown dust unload buckets full of raw sardines. All the refugees rush to get in line for food. My teenage brother held me back saying, today is our last day to get a meal like this before we depart to America. We can take our time. When the crowd was gone, my oldest brother, nearly an adult, walked to the soldiers and returned with three raw sardines and a bag filled with two handfuls of rice. We walked the dirt road home, my five-year-old stomach wanting me to hurry, my bare feet telling me to slow down and avoid the tooth-sharp pebbles. My mother stood waiting in her black dress outside the bamboo hut. Usually full of worry and nervousness, she smiled when we handed her the rice and silver fish. Our departure from a year trapped behind the barbed wire camp fence was tomorrow. Twenty minutes later, my mother, eight siblings, and I surrounded a paper plate of fried sardines and rice on the dirt floor. My youngest sist sister, Yur, ate first. Our hands unwashed, we took turns. For my mother, there was nothing left except the meatless head. She took it and smiled. The sardines were so salty, I had to stuff my mouth with a handful of rice. Mom, I said, did you put a lot of salt on this sardine? Why is it so salty? No, my son, she said. It is your tears. An airplane flew somewhere far above us. I was frightened of what life in America would be like. Let go of everything, my mom said. It's time to start a new life. Now, 12 years later, sardines still taste like tears. I sat in my car reading the Chipotle bag. Now remember, I had expected another lighthearted story. What I got instead was a sad commentary on the state of our world. Sardines that taste like tears and five-year-olds who know what war is. When the realities of our globe come crashing into our lives, what do we do? We can go on with our day. We can let our hearts become calloused so that stories on Chipotle bags don't impact us, hardened so that news headlines elicit no sympathy. Or as Christians, we can take things like this as a call to prayer. The first time I remember registering the phrase, a call to prayer, was in the wake of the events of September 11, 2001. As our nation huddled around living room TV sets, watching heartbreaking footage playing on a loop, the phrase, a call to prayer, was frequently repeated. It was a time of turmoil, of crisis, and people started to pray. 
Fifteen years later, it doesn't seem like things have changed all that much. Turmoil is all around us. Refugee children still wait in lines for sardines. A call to prayer. Bills wait on the agenda of Senates regarding federal funding for church schools. A call to prayer. The state of our nation's politics. A call to prayer on both sides. Injustice of political shoot, of shootings, police shootings, of racial inequalities, a call to prayer. Young people who go out for hikes, leaving summer camp behind and don't come back, a call to prayer. A new school building, the kids home for summer, preparing for camp meeting, sickness challenges at work, conflict, calls to prayer. In our world, our community, our family here at East, crisis abounds. It is still a time of turmoil, and we need prayer. Acts is the New Testament book which records the experiences of the fledgling Christian church. It is full of foreign occupation, of political corruption, of religious oppression, turmoil, and hatred. It is also full of prayer. We pick up today's story in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. The infant church is in the midst of turmoil. Persecution has begun. Stephen has been stoned. James has been put to death. It's election year. And to curry favor with that side of the aisle who doesn't always like him, Herod arrests Peter. Since Jesus' resurrection and return to heaven, Peter has emerged as a leader in the church. He plays a starring role among the apostolic cast, figuring prominently in eight of the first 11 chapters of the book of Acts. His imprisonment, especially following James' death, is a low blow to the church. Verse 4. After arresting him, Peter, he, Herod, put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring, to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Herod, also known as Herod Agrippa, isn't taking any chances. He's heard the rumors, empty tombs, walking cripples, vacant jail cells, and he assigns not one, not two, not three, but four squads to watch over Peter. Sixteen sentinels to watch over one fisherman turned evangelist. The story could end there. Peter in prison, Herod guarding him carefully. But verse 5 follows verse 4. So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Has there ever been something that you have had to be taught over and over again before you finally grasped it? My mother is very good at a great many things. We have beautiful gardens at my house. She is a fantastic cook and a wonderful hostess. But something my mother is not is tech savvy. My father and I have spent quite a bit of time patiently and admittedly sometimes not so patiently, explaining over and over how to send an email or attach a file to that email, how to select ta 
text within a Word document what the function of a browser is. And typically it takes more than once before these lessons are fully ingrained. Prayer is a lesson that I have been slow to learn. It is probably not yet fully ingrained in me. I'm easily distracted by my own thoughts and am prone to impetuous actions over quiet contemplation. But prayer is a lesson that God keeps bringing me back to, hoping I imagine that through enough repetition, I might finally get it. James 5 verse 16 says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I'm sure that if we took the time to go row by row through the church today, that many of us, most of us, could share stories of prayer. Stories of our struggles with prayer, stories of prayers that have impacted our lives, time when prayer has done powerful things for us and in us. The early church knows the power of prayer. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Peter is no stranger to bizarre and unusual dreams. In Acts chapter 10, as Peter is taking a midday nap, he dreams of a sheet full of squirmy, wormy, wriggly, unclean animals being lowered out of heaven. He hears a voice say, rise, Peter, kill and eat, and this is repeated three times. Upon awaking from that nap, Peter does not find a sheet or creatures sharing his napping location. The message of the dream becomes clear and the prayers that it answers as we read that story. So when we read this story, it's not a jump in logic for Peter to think that this is a dream, a vision of an angel sent to give him courage and hope to show him that everything is going to be okay, that his destiny rests in God's will. The community is praying, and strange things happen when people pray. When people pray, visions aren't outside of the realm of possibility. Verse 10. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Peter is walking side by side with the angel. They get to the end of the block, and his companion is gone. Peter finds himself alone on a dark street corner. He looks around. Surely this isn't the end of the vision. He's not awake yet. Where did his angel companion go? The cool night air nips at his shoulders. He pulls his cloak tighter, craning his neck, looking this way and that. And in the process, he stumbles off the curb, stubbing his toe. As pain shoots through him, he realizes something. Could it be? He pinches himself. 
He takes a few tentative steps and then with laughter begins to run. It's not a dream. It's real. The angel has freed him. Verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Like anyone newly released from prison, Peter goes to his family. He knows that the community will have gathered at Mary's house, and so he hurries that direction. Something miraculous has just happened. And Peter knows that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. While Peter and his angel have been performing this daring escape, the community has been hard at work with their prayers. Do we work at prayer? Do we grasp the lessons that maybe we've been slow to learn? Like my mother learning a new computer skill, do we practice what we've been taught? In the winter of 2011, I was working as a student grader for Walla Walla University's School of Theology. One of the assignments that I was to grade was called Reflection on Prayer. It was a, an easy A assignment, an in-class participation worksheet and something that was fairly easy for me to grade. As I was recording scores, I came across the following answer. What is prayer? The student's answer, prayer is talking to God. It is an ever-going conversation. What is the purpose of prayer? The purpose is to day by day, come to know God better. It's a way to build that relationship. After gaining permission, I made a copy of that student's worksheet because this is a great answer. Prayer is talking to God. It's an ever-going conversation. The purpose is, day by day, to come to know God better. By this definition, prayer is not passive. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. She kept insisting that it was so, but Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. The community of believers has gathered at Mary's house. Though it's the middle of the night, they aren't sleeping. You see, Peter's trial is in the morning. Given the state of politics, they expect the worst. It's a time of turmoil. What happens is beyond their wildest dreams. They believe in prayer, but they don't believe Rhoda. You must be crazy. You're out of your mind. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They've been tricked into thinking that prayer isn't doing. But prayer is not passive. You see, when people pray, strange things happen. When people pray, angels appear. When people pray, chains won't adhere. When people pray, prisoners disappear. Amen. We can face the world without fear today because when people pray, freedom is realized, servants are surprised, and Herods are deprived. When people pray, strange things happen. Verse 18, in the morning there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. It was a time of turmoil in the country, in the church. People started to pray. Prayer is talking to God. 
It's an ever-going conversation. The purpose is to day by day come to know God better. Prayer is not passive. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Strange things happen when people pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad that you have given us the gift of prayer. This week, let every trauma, every disagreement, every headline in the news be a call to you and to prayer. We are slow to learn your lessons. Continue to teach us, continue to forgive us when we stumble. Help us to expect the strange, to believe and acknowledge the answers that you sent. Our world is in crisis, and every day we face turmoil. We need you. We give you our worries. Let us be a people who pray. Amen.